Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about current probes, measurement errors and well transformers in general. Specifically I want to talk about this thing. This is a current probe I built for a previous video on quartz crystal oscillators to measure the current going through the crystal. And based on the theoretical analysis of the turns ratio and measurement instrument load, we should have gotten 10 millivolts for each milliamp going through the measured line. But when I tested it out, I only got 7.68 millivolts for each milliamp. Now that's an almost 25% error, which is quite a lot. So what went wrong? Well, if you're curious, then keep watching. Now, at first, I didn't really bother with this experiment result, but as some of my viewers pointed out, this is an unacceptable level of error for this particular application. So cheap equipment is not enough to explain it. So what went wrong then? I mean, is the calculation wrong? Not really, it's based on well-established transformer theory, so what then? Well, as it turns out, it's a two-point problem. On the one side, it's a measurement error issue, and on the other side, it has to do with neglected parasitic elements. So for such a simple circuit, there are quite a lot of things that can go wrong when you're not paying attention. So let's take things one at a time, see how we can improve our measurement results. Let's start off by taking a closer look at how the measurement was performed previously, specifically how the current going through the probe was measured. So what I have here is a screenshot of the previous measurement, I used a 50 ohm resistor made from two 100 ohm resistors in parallel. These were carbon film resistors and the probe was measuring over this point and the ground. Now there's two things to consider here. First of all, the carbon film resistor isn't the best resistor out there. And specifically what we're interested in are the parasitic elements that it has. So other than resistance, resistors will also have a bit of series inductance, which is not helping us. Secondly, this bit of wire, which also has a ferrite ring around it, also has inductance. So we have two elements of series inductance in series with the resistor and the probe was measuring over all of these. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that at 8 MHz where the measurement was being performed, even one microhenry of inductance has an equivalent impedance of 50.2 ohms. So that's even more than the resistor was supposed to have. Now I'm not saying I had one microhenry here, but I wasn't extremely far off. Normally, current probes are measured using special jigs that hold the probe in place and ensure a uniform magnetic field around them. So to make this measurement a bit more reliable and repeatable, I made a crude attempt at such a setup and we can remeasure the response using this thing. So I built this from some scrap PCBs, a couple SMA connectors, screws, and a spring-loaded test needle. So I built it in a way that it can be taken apart when you wish to change the probe. So first off, let's retest the probe's bandwidth by using the new fixture. So ideally, this fixture, when the probe is inside of it, should represent a 50 ohm transmission line. But well, that's not really the case here. So Let's try to compensate for that, first of all, by using the normalized function that the spectrum analyzer and tracking generator has. So for that, I will be injecting a signal from the tracking generator output through the test fixture, which has the probe included, probe being terminated with a 50 ohm termination, and then the output of the fixture gets connected to the spectrum analyzer's input. So by normalizing it, whatever passes through the circuit is adapted so that it is represented as a flat line, and from here we can see how changing things in the system will affect the response. So for that, I will connect the 50 ohm termination to the output of the fixture and connect the spectrum analyzer input to the current probe. So now what we're seeing is the response of the probe starting from 100 kilohertz up to 1.5 gigahertz. And we can see it on a three decibel per division scale. So we can see it's far more flat than our previous measurement and it stays within this plus minus three decibel range up until around seven to 800 megahertz, after which we can see the output dropping down. So even though we don't have a perfectly flat response, this is looking better than our previous measurements. So the fixture seems to be helping. So now we can redo 
the experiment to see the probe's response at 8 MHz. So for that I prepared the setup with the signal generator and the oscilloscope. So using the fixture now, I will be injecting a signal from the signal generator through the test fixture. And then from this it goes through a cable to the oscilloscope's input, where I also added a termination resistor through a T-junction, so this goes into the second channel of the oscilloscope. And then on the first channel, the probe is connected again to another T-junction, where I have a termination, and this goes into the oscilloscope. So hopefully this way the entire system is 50 ohms, and we should be able to get a good accurate measurement. So let's see what happens. So I injected a signal, we can see it on the second channel, so let's just adjust it a bit, take a single capture. So I already prepared some automated measurements here. We have an input signal, so on the second channel, 708 millivolts peak to peak, and the probe is giving us a response of 123.2 millivolts peak to peak. And we also have the RMS values, so 249 millivolts on the current measurement and 42.55 on the probe. So if we go through the math using these values, we get a probe response of 8.5 or 8.7 millivolts per milliamp. So we're much closer to 10 than we were before. So previously we got 7.67, but we're still missing something though. Well, this is where it gets a bit tricky because now we need to look at how the transformer works in a bit more detail to figure out what is still missing. Now, when talking about transformers, the common analysis will tell you that the turns ratio, so between primary and secondary, is equal to the voltage ratio, so input voltage to output voltage, and it's equal to the inverse of the currents, so it's equal to the output current divided by the input current. And this last bit is what a current transformer relies upon. Now, if these two are true, then so will the product of the terms be true. So the input voltage times input current will be equal to the output voltage times output current. Or in other words, the input power will be equal to the output power. Now, in a simplified model, or well, in the ideal world, this is perfectly true. But not in the real world. If you've ever looked at a transformer that has some sort of power going through it, you may have noticed that it's quite warm. Now, if you don't have infrared eyes, you'll have to touch it to feel it. But regardless, the point is that not all of the power that goes into a transformer actually comes out the other way. So in real life, the output power will always be smaller than the input power because of various losses. So if this power equation isn't true, then there's probably some issue with this part. So now let's analyze the transformer model in a bit more detail to see exactly what's going on with this bit. Now, a transformer's operation is explained by Faraday's law of induction. A variable current going through a coil will create a magnetic flux around it based on the number of turns, and then this flux, when it goes through another coil based on the number of turns that has, will induce a voltage. So that's where the turns to voltage ratio comes from. Now, in the real world, when you're building a transformer, not all of the flux created by the first inductor will actually reach the second inductor, some of it will leak out, so it's called leakage flux, and at the same time, not all of the windings of the second inductor will actually be passed by flux from the first inductor. So in both cases, the part of the two inductors which are not part of the magnetic flux circuit is called leakage inductance. So these two are modeled as series inductors in the two circuits. So we got our leakage inductance on the primary, and we got our leakage inductance on the secondary. Now, another thing to mention about transformers is that they're built from real-life wire. And one of the problems with real-life wire is that other than the inductance it will be creating, wire also has resistance. So, other than these inductors, in our transformer model, we also have equivalent series resistance on the primary and on the secondary caused by the wiring. So now, if you're applying a voltage to a transformer, part of it will drop on the series resistance, part of it will drop on the series inductance, and only a part of the input voltage will actually reach the ideal bit of the transformer, where the turns to voltage ratio is true, and then on the secondary, we have the same phenomenon occurring, the voltage coming out of the transformer, part of it will drop on the series inductance, part of it will drop on the series resistance. 
So even though the turns to voltage ratio is true on the ideal bit of the transformer, because of the various losses, it will not be true over the overall structure of the transformer. So the output voltage will always be smaller than the input voltage times the turns ratio. Now these parasitics will also have an impact on the current probe's performance, specifically because of the parasitic elements on the secondary side. So to highlight this I prepared a couple simulations. So first of all I have a reference circuit in which I have an ideal transformer and a 50 ohm load and that's it. And secondly I added a 10 ohm series resistance, so it's way more than you will actually get but this is just to highlight the phenomenon. If we compare the two, the main effect that the series resistance had was to change the low frequency bandwidth, so that's not good but that's not that big of an issue. However, if we add series inductance, so this is for example if the coupling factor is not ideal, and we'll be looking at that in just a moment, so the added inductance brings the output result all around to a lower value. And we can see that this is the same effect if we use a non-ideal transformer, so the coupling factor is only 90% here, and we get roughly the same thing. So one of the big issues of a current probe will come from the coupling factor. The more uncoupled inductance you have, the more of an effect it will have on your measured value. Now, from a current point of view, the ideal part of the transformer should allow you to say that the ratio of turns is equal to the inverse of the currents. But that bit is not entirely true, unless we update the transformer model a bit. So just to explain what I'm talking about, if we have a transformer with an open secondary, so the secondary winding is open circuit, it will behave exactly the same way as an inductor without a secondary. So as a transformer that doesn't have a secondary winding. And the thing is that if you apply a voltage to an inductor that doesn't have a secondary or it has a secondary but it's open, there will still be current running through the inductor, even though there's no current running through the secondary. So where is this current going? Well, the thing is, for a transformer to work, you need to have magnetic flux running, and whether that flux is consumed or not by the secondary, you still need to maintain the magnetic flux. So the missing element in our model is a so-called magnetizing reactance. So this appears in parallel with our ideal transformer, and this is also sometimes called an open circuit inductance. So you can measure this when the secondary is in an open circuit. And part of the input current goes through this, part of it through the ideal transformer. So when there's no load on the secondary, you still get your voltage ratio, but you will not get any sort of current because all of it will be passing through this magnetizing inductance. When you do have a load, well this thing still doesn't disappear, so you'll always have some sort of current running through this bit. And this magnetizing inductance can also be used to help explain why the transformer has a low frequency bandwidth limit. Because at low frequency, the current rather than going through the ideal bit, will be short-circuited by this thing. So to illustrate this effect, what I have here is an ideal transformer with one microhenry inductors, so the coupling factor is one, and the output load is 50.27 ohms. And as we previously discussed, 50.27 ohms is the impedance of a one microhenry inductor at eight megahertz. So now if we run the simulation, how do you think the transformer will react? So where will the corner frequency be at the low frequencies? So whether we check the voltage or the current, let's just check the current, we have a final flat response of, well, zero decibels, so what goes in will go out, because it's an ideal transformer, but we get our minus three decibel point at almost exactly eight megahertz. So when the impedance of our input inductor is equal to the load with a one-to-one -one transformer ratio, that is where we get our minus three decibel point, so our corner frequency. Now it's important to mention that if you don't want to see this effect, you need to be one decade above this frequency, so with this setup, to be in the flat region, we need to be 10 times higher than our corner frequency, so at 80 megahertz. So this is something to keep in mind. Now of course if you don't have a one to one turns ratio, say you have something different, what I have here is two examples. In one example we have a secondary inductance 10 times larger than the primary, and our load is the same, so in this case, 
with our red trace. So we go from minus 10 decibels to minus 13 at around 800 kilohertz. So by increasing the inductance ratio or the square of the turns ratio, we went to a lower frequency. So we can get the same corner frequency as we did before by also increasing the resistance. So with this final circuit where both the secondary inductance and the secondary load were increased 10 times, we get the same corner frequency, so in green, as we got with our very first measurement in blue. It's just that the level is lower. So we can say that our corner frequency is equal to the output load divided by 2 times pi times the inductance of the secondary or times the inductance of the primary multiplied by the inductance ratio. Now at this point it's important to mention that the probe that I've built with 5 turns has about 1.6 microhenry on the secondary inductor, so this inductance coupled with the 50 ohm load gives a corner frequency of about 5 MHz. So we will get rid of this low frequency bandwidth limitation only one decade above that at 50 MHz. Now I try to compensate for this with an added capacitor, but we'll get to that in a moment. Now there's one more thing to mention about the inductance of the windings, and that is that the inductance isn't just related to the number of turns, it's also related to the magnetic permeability of the core. And the magnetic permeability of the core, again, is not a constant, it's frequency dependent, but it's also dependent on the amount of magnetic flux. So if you have a lot of magnetic flux, the core will start to saturate and the permeability will drop. So this low frequency bandwidth limit is also current dependent. If you have very high currents running through the probe, the inductance will drop, so the corner frequency will move to a higher value. Now, there are two more important parasitic elements to consider when talking about transformers and current passing through transformers. First of all, we've got our core losses. So this is modeled as a resistor in parallel with the primary. So this represents energy that goes into the core in the form of a magnetic flux and comes out in the form of heat. So it's energy that does not reach the secondary side. So part of the input current will go into this thing and this core loss is frequency dependent. So this will not help at all with keeping the probe linear. And last thing to mention are the various capacitances present in a transformer. So on the one side we have distributed capacitance, which is a capacitance in parallel with each of the inductors. And then we have interwinding capacitance which is a capacitance in between primary and secondary. And now, especially this distributed capacitance is the one responsible for limiting our high frequency bandwidth. So especially this thing will short circuit the transformer at high frequencies, thus limiting its upper bandwidth. Now, it's also worth mentioning that other than the capacitance that the transformer itself has, you've also got capacitance from the equipment to which it's connected to. So if you're driving some sort of capacitive load, then this will also have an impact on the upper frequency bandwidth of the transformer. Now we can check out this effect by starting off from the one-to-one -one transformer. So if we simulate this by adding a 50 ohm load, we only see our high pass effect at low frequency. So we have a low frequency corner frequency. But now if we add a capacitor to the mix, so whether it's on the primary side or on the secondary side, we get the exact same effect. So for the same value capacitor with an ideal one-to-one -one transformer, it doesn't really matter where the added distributed capacitance is, if it's on the primary or the secondary. Now, on the other hand, if we have different inductance ratios, so not a one-to-one -one transformer, first of all, what I have here is a one to 10 inductance ratio transformer with 10 picofarads on the output. And if we look at the response of this circuit, so we can see that the all around level is smaller because of the inductance ratio our low frequency corner frequency moved to the left because of the increased secondary inductance, but our right side corner frequency stayed in exactly the same place. So just like we had with the one-to-one -one transformer with 10 picofarads on it. So we can quickly confirm this by changing the level of the second trace. So I multiplied it by roughly the square root of 10, and we can see that it follows exactly the same line as our previous transformer. Now what's also interesting to observe is this right side transformer, so we have the same 1 to 10 inductance ratio, but this time we have 100 picofarads on the primary, and this circuit gives exactly the same response. So the high frequency corner frequency of the transformer is related to the load, the inductances ratio, and the added parallel capacitance. 
Now there's one more important thing to mention about this added capacitance, specifically one from added equipment. So if we start off from our reference circuit and we add a series capacitor, so this is useful to boost the response at low frequencies, so creating a second order filter, this added capacitor, when you add also extra parallel capacitance to the load, will interact with it. So if we just zoom in to better see this, adding this extra 10 picofarad capacitor after we added the 1 nanofarad will slightly boost the signal. Now, this is a problem because this amount of boosting is dependent on the added parallel capacitance. So if I now add 20 picofarads instead of 10, and we zoom in again, the level of boosting increases. So although this sort of series capacitor will help to boost the response at low frequencies, it will end up interacting with any sort of parallel capacitance that occurs on the final load, thus ruining your probe's overall response. Now, regarding the effect of added external measurement equipment, it's important to point out that in general the high impedance input of an oscilloscope is in the 10 to 20 picofarad range, a length of coax cable will be somewhere between 50 and 100 picofarads per meter, and even if you use a 10x passive probe, that will still have 10 to 30 picofarads on the input depending on the probe. So even if your probe has quite a high bandwidth to begin with, this can be severely limited by the equipment you connect it to. So for the best results, you will have to connect this to a 50 ohm system, so both transmission line and termination, without any added parasitics. And well, a final thing to mention is the impact of the output load. So what I have here on the upper side is the 1 to 1 transformer with 50 ohm load and 10 picofarad, so this is what we have displayed. And what I have here on the bottom is the same 1 to 1 transformer, 10 picofarads, 50 ohm loads, but an extra 50 ohms added. So the total output load is 25 ohms. Now if we look at the response of this thing, first of all the overall level went down because the output load is smaller, but we can also see that our two corner frequencies, so at low frequencies and at high frequencies, have both been shifted. So by decreasing the load, we can improve the bandwidth of the probe by sacrificing the output amplitude. So this is just a thing to keep in mind, since both these corner frequencies, both the lower and high frequency ones, are dependent on the output load. The smaller the load, the wider the response of the probe will be. So why didn't I get the current to voltage ratio that was expected with the probe? Well, first of all, because it's not even possible. So thanks to the various losses and non-ideal properties, you will always get a slightly smaller ratio than predicted by the simplifier transformer analysis. But of course, how close or far you are from the ideal case is based on how the probe is built, the measurement equipment properties, and of course the frequency at which you're performing the measurement at. So you can make some good choices and be close to the ideal ratio, or you can make some bad choices and well, end up with what I got. In the end, making a good current probe is not that easy. So there's a good reason why these things are so expensive. But regardless, once you start taking into account the various limitations and system elements, you can make quite a reliable probe and well, a good measurement tool. So I will continue working on the car probe another time to try to improve its behavior and get it a bit closer to the ideal device. But for now, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.